Welcome to the do's and don'ts of employee appreciation during tough times. My name is Denise Boudreaux-Scott and I am the president of Drive and I'm thrilled that you're here with me today. Napoleon described leaders as dealers in hope. And yes, as a leader, you have to share hope with others, but you also have to be filled with hope yourself in order to do that. What you're going to learn today is going to give you the ability to share hope with others and fill yourself with hope as well. And the type of leadership that I'm going to talk to you about is very intentional. There's nothing left up to chance because you have to be intentional about finding ways to celebrate accomplishments Otherwise, they become missed opportunities. And accomplishments don't have to be the usual things that you think about, like a 10-year anniversary or successful completion of a major project. It's the small, everyday accomplishments that are just as important, too. And that is especially so in times of crisis or during tough times, whatever that might mean for you. So I'm excited to be sharing with you what I've seen over the years that some leaders are getting really correct, really right when it comes to appreciation, and also what some leaders are doing that's probably frustrating them and their team. And by the way, you're going to hear about all the mistakes I made as a leader over the years as well. So I'm not immune to this stuff, and I'm so glad that I've learned about it now. So according to Gallup, People that don't feel recognized are twice as likely, twice as likely to say that they'll quit in the next year. So appreciation and recognition is probably the biggest missed opportunity for leaders, managers, supervisors, because praise and recognition are the fuel that fills your team members' tanks. And think about this like your car, and, and hopefully your car doesn't look like this, but think about this like your car. How long could you forget to fill your car tank up, the gas tank in your car up? After a while of putting it off, it'll just stop working, right? Your car is just going to stop. Uh, and by the way, don't ask me how I know about that because I've done that a few times in my life. Um, but the tank of our team members is the same way with appreciation. You can't wait until people's tanks are bone dry to realize that you need to fill them up. And that's especially true right now when people are dealing with so much in the world. Emotions are high. People are scared. They're working with constant changes. And they're burning through the gas in their tank a whole lot quicker because of it. So they need even more love, more thanks, more appreciation than ever before. So let's dive right into the do's and don'ts of employee appreciation. And we're going to start with the stuff that you may be getting wrong first. And then I'm going to spend with you most of our time on the important part, how you can get it right. So if you've ever wished oh my gosh, can somebody just give me a manual for leading during a tough time, during a time of crisis? I promise to share with you at the end of this presentation a way that you can get a leadership playbook, play by play, that is the answer to all of your prayers. So let's dive right into the do's and don'ts. The first don't is to don't think it's all about you. The second don't we're going to talk about is not giving cookie cutter praise. Then we're going to talk about not depending on recognition programs. That one takes people by surprise sometimes. And then finally, don't share gifts as appreciation. As appreciation. And I'm going to dive into each of these don'ts a bit deeper so let's start with this first one, which is don't think it's all about you. Now, you might be saying kind of, yeah, mushy feelings, pumping people up all the time. Yeah, that's not really my thing. I meet a lot of people that say that to me. 
Being a compassionate leader and leading from the heart does not mean you are a soft leader. There is nothing soft about it, in fact. And 40 years of research has shown that there are just five principles that make a leader exemplary. Not 100, not 50, not 10, five, just five. And appreciation is one of them. That means encouraging the heart is incredibly important. And in my view, it's not up for negotiation. Whether you like it or not, whether it comes naturally or not, you have to do it. It's like a firefighter. My dad was a New York City firefighter for 33 years. And he couldn't show up at work and say, you know, I love squirting the water at the fire. I like investigating how the fire started, but I don't really like carrying that hose too much. It's not an option. Carrying the hose was part of his job and appreciation and encouraging the heart is part of yours as a leader. So lots of times I see leaders falling into this trap thinking that they are solely responsible for appreciation. And what happens when you think that way, the number one excuse I hear comes up and that's this, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to go around and share appreciation with everybody. So today I want you to see that appreciation does not rest on your shoulders alone. And I want to tell you in a bit about who can help you with appreciation because you might be worried about having time. So don't fall into this trap thinking that you solely are alone, are responsible and uh, for appreciation in your organization. But I will tell you, if you as a leader don't make appreciation a priority in your organization, you are going to have a team that doesn't value appreciation either, whether that's the leaders and supervisors that work under, under you or the team of people that report directly to you appreciation for each other. None of them are going to uh, really have a value for appreciation if you don't. So there are a lot of people that can be meaningly, meaningfully involved in making team members feel more valued. Um, and like I said, I promise to share with you in a little bit all about that. So let's talk about our next don't, which is all about not sharing cookie cutter praise. And this is one of the most common mistakes that I see. And it's really a significant one because it's kind of funny that it impacts negatively the person receiving the cookie cutter praise and the person giving the cookie cutter praise. So what's cookie cutter praise you might be asking? Cookie cutter praise is stuff like, good job today, or you're a hero, or, you know, you did, a, you did a really good today. Very general things. It could be even a form letter from the CEO saying thank you to all the employees. Are these bad things? No, not necessarily. But they usually do nothing to make the person on the receiving end feel valued. And when praise is so generic that it can fit any employee, it often goes in one ear and out the other. And that's the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, the person is silently mocking at you in, your, in their head. They're saying things like, good job today. <laughs> like you even know what I do around here. Um, phrases like, like just really are mocking you for that general um, praise that you've given I have, a I have a client that called me a while ago to tell me they were giving uh, all of their employees a bonus. And the residents and, and people that uh, received services from the organization had actually raised this money. And they had written this lovely note that went along with the bonus. And it said many wonderful, glowing things about all the employees that work there. The problem, it said many wonderful, glowing things about all of the employees. It wasn't specific. It wasn't meaningful. And I told the CEO that the staff would love their bonus, but it would not make them any, make them feel any more valued. Feel, very important word. And I want you to remember that we're going to be talking about that some more. 
So as a leader, you can encourage the heart by publicly recognizing team members who exemplify their commitment to your shared values. What does that mean? Simply put, put the shining light on your team members that embody your organizational values. Focus on what's going well. That can be kind of tough during stressful situations. And it's easy to slip into this negative mindset when we're sort of so emotionally drained as leaders and the team is emotionally drained as well, mentally and physically drained too. But what a difference it makes when you as a leader make an effort to focus on the positive. Remember, what you focus on is going to grow. So you're creating a future every time you point out a negative behavior or a positive behavior. So think about what future do you want? Do you want more negative or you want more positive? I'm assuming your answer is positive. So I want you to think about the values or behaviors that you want to see in your organization. Maybe you want to see more teamwork between departments. The next time someone comes from a different department, take the time to stop what you're doing and acknowledge it. Thank them for it. Hey, John, I noticed that when you were heading back to the um, break room, you stopped to help the housekeeper who was struggling with her housekeeping cart. Thank you for supporting someone, helping someone who doesn't even work in your department. We're all in this together. And I see that you get that by the fact that you helped her and didn't think twice about it. By the way, if you find yourself going to the negative a lot, don't blame yourself, right? You're looking around for what's wrong and uh, when you're uh, walking around your organization, uh, picking out the things that aren't done right. Uh, we're, we're wired as humans to see the negative. And researchers think it goes back to our caveman days when we were kind of constantly on the hunt and look out for what was going wrong. Uh, maybe there's a guy with a club on the cave next to us or a woolly mammoth to, uh, to my left. Uh, so it's not your fault that you see that negative, but we want to focus more on the positive for sure. A familiar story for me uh, when I was a leader, this sense of sharing appreciation with people, but them not feeling appreciated. It was super disheartening to me and frustrating. And I'll share with you a, a sad but true story. When I was a nursing home administrator, we had this huge snowstorm in our area. And our, we were really impacted. People had a hard time getting to work, took hours on the bus. People drove in together, got rides. I went in, out and picked people up in my truck. And my team showed up despite all of that. And I was so proud of them. And so about a week after the snowstorm, I thought, let me thank them all by getting them sweatshirts with our organization's name on them. And the sweatshirts arrived a couple weeks later. And I was handing them out from my office and personally thanking people. But that soon became really hard and a big hassle. And, you know, I'd be in a meeting and there'd be a on the door or a knock on the door, someone there for their sweatshirt or I'd be on the phone. And so I had to find a way to more efficiently, or so I thought, give out the gifts. So I came up with this brilliant idea. I wrote a nice letter to say every, thank you to everyone. And I made a bunch of copies of it. And then I left the letters and the sweatshirts with the receptionist. And she was always at the desk and she could help people a lot more efficiently than I could. So a week later, after we gave all these sweatshirts out, started hearing rumblings. Denise didn't even thank us for coming in during the storm. She didn't even care that it took me two hours to get in. And on and on and on. People did not appreciate that I had appreciated them. How dare they? I had spent time not only to pick out sweatshirts, but I had my job because I wasn't supposed to be spending money on these things. And all this was a whole heck of a lot of work. I was so angry. It's a true story. I was so angry. I picked up my book of 1001 Ways to Recognize Employees, and I threw it across the room into a trash can. If, however, I had practiced the important behaviors I'm going to share with you in just a second, sweatshirt gate would never have happened. So there is something you can do about this frustration that you might be experiencing and that your team might be experiencing as well. 
And we're going to get to that in just a bit. But let's continue on with our don'ts. Our next don't is all about depending on a recognition program to make your team members feel valued. And this is based on my experience with hundreds of organizations and thousands of employees over the years. I'm going to guess that your recognition program that you are depending on for appreciation isn't cutting it. I see recognition programs fail more than I see them work. And the worst part about it is that often the top leaders who are good people think that they're wonderful programs. I'll give you an example of this. In one organization, I was sitting outside of the HR office, human resources office, early one morning, waiting for it to open. And a CNA who had worked the night shift was sitting beside me, waiting for the same thing. And as we were chatting, he looked up and he noticed his name on the giant television screen, along with some other team members' names. And he said to me, look at that. That's my name. And he was so like chest out, he was so proud soaring with pride. And he said, I wonder what I got an award for. No one told me my name would be up there. What a waste. What a waste. Think about it. Someone took time to type his name into a computer so he could be on that screen. A big committee met for hours to choose the winners that month. The executive team spends time to review that committee's recommendations. But in the end, they totally missed the mark with their beloved recognition program. They failed to make the person feel, remember I said that word feel is important, feel recognized. So if your recognition program consists of length of service awards and employee of the month, I can almost guarantee you, you are missing the mark. And I give you so much credit for trying but my guess is you're frustrated with why your team members keep wanting more appreciation and yet you feel like you're already giving so much of it. Most recognition programs are so generic that they're not even perceived as genuine. They're not individualized. And by the way, if you're saying, but I put everyone's name on the certificate, that doesn't count. And often doing these things can work against you. I'm going to share with you another shocking don't that people are always surprised to learn about, and that is to not share gifts as appreciation, to not share gifts as appreciation. Let's talk a little bit about this one and dive into it. So people assume that a gift, um, like, and when I say gift, I mean a gift card, food, and so forth, are going to make people feel valued. And it's such an easy one too, isn't it? It's no need to get all awkward with finding the right words to say uh, or, you know, thinking exactly how do I put it so eloquently what this person has done. You just give people 20 bucks to spend at Dunkin' Donuts and you've done your, your job, you've done your work. The problem with this is that most people, for them, gifts don't make them feel appreciated. Gifts do not make them feel appreciated. In fact, for over 90% of people, they don't feel any more valued when receiving a gift than if they got nothing at all. So you might be asking yourself, okay, you've told us all this stuff not to do. What the heck does make people feel valued? What the heck makes them feel appreciated? So let's get into the do's the do part, not the don'ts, of appreciation and find out exactly what you can do. First, we're going to talk about support, creating a culture of appreciation. So a culture that supports appreciation um, where everybody is part of it. We're going to talk about giving specific praise. We're going to talk about spending your time on meaningful recognition, not this cookie cutter stuff, but meaningful recognition. And finally, we're going to talk about how you can find out what each person wants for appreciation. So supporting a culture of appreciation. Remember I said earlier, it doesn't have to be just you that is giving appreciation in your organization. And in fact, it helps if you have lots of people involved with it. So we want to think about if you had this feeling of you're not enough, or if you've ever had this feeling that uh, you're not doing enough, that you're not bringing enough to the table, 
if you've ever felt this, I can't believe they've entrusted me with this job because I don't really know what the heck I'm doing. I want you to think about the fact that you right now are in the right place. Because by the way, I've said every one of those things at some point in my career and probably 10 times this week alone. So you're not alone in this. The thing with leadership is it's a skill that you need to just keep practicing. Okay? The skill that you just keep practicing and we're creating cultures that are bringing out this in everybody, not just us as a leader, just as a leader. So no matter how long you've been doing this or how great you think that you are as a leader, practicing is what makes you better and helps you be more resilient because then you're prepared for the challenges ahead. So when you practice creating a culture of appreciation, you alone are not solely responsible for making people feel valued for their contributions. Because too often as a leader, I don't know about you, but I felt this many times. I felt like I was kind of standing alone. Right? I was out there sort of as an island, but it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, in one study, Gallup asked people to recall who gave them their most meaningful and memorable recognition. Right? They asked people, who gave you your most meaningful and memorable recognition? And guess what it revealed? It's pretty interesting. It revealed, maybe not a surprise, that recognition isn't all about you. It actually showed that people said, 28% of people said it was my manager who gave me the most meaningful recognition. 24% said it was the top person in the in organization, the CEO or the president. 12% said it was their manager's managers, two levels up from them. 10% of people said it was the customers or the people that they serve. And 9% of people said it was their peers. So when you look at this list, what you can see is it isn't all on you. It is not all on you to share appreciation with people. And if you're short on time, knowing that others can be part of sharing appreciation is hugely important. It's really, once again, having this culture of appreciation. Everyone can contribute their thanks, their praise, their gratitude. So don't be a martyr and think it's all on your shoulders. It's only you, right? We know for a fact through the study that it is other people. 72% of people said their meaning, most meaningful recognition came from somebody else. So don't put it all on your shoulders. Creating this culture of appreciation, encouraging people to share their praise for someone else, highlight that when you see it. If you see someone thanking another team member, thank them for doing that. Focus on the positive stuff more than the negative. As you're walking around, constantly point out the positive. All of that helps shift the energy in your culture to one where you are not alone sharing appreciation. So unfortunately, 79% of people who leave their jobs say they do so because they don't feel appreciated. There's that word again, feel. I really think it's going to be, or feel, that it's going to be the most important word that you take away from this whole session. Because with so much going on, in our world today. And it's an incredibly tough time for so many people. If you are not appreciating your team members, making them feel valued, they are going to leave. They are going to leave. The job market is way too tight. They have options. So instead of generic praise, you need to be giving specific praise. 79% of people leave their jobs because they don't feel appreciated, not because they don't think their boss didn't thank them, not because they didn't get a bonus, not because their boss didn't try. 79% of people left because they didn't feel appreciated. Specific praise makes people feel appreciated. And specific praise is particular to that one individual person. It could be about an action that they just took to help someone, or it could be about their personality. But the praise should be specifically to them and not able to be applied to anyone else who works in the organization. 
And this is kind of what I always think of for a red flag. If the recognition that you're about to give somebody could apply to anyone else in the organization, it's probably not specific enough. So think about that. Think about that as your red flag, right? I can apply this appreciation to somebody else. It's probably not specific enough. So what stands in the way of sharing meaningful recognition? What gets in the way of it? We know that it's important, but what gets in the way? Very often, it's not knowing what type of appreciation a person wants. So 15 years later, after my sweatshirt gate incident that I described earlier, I met Dr. Paul White, who is the co-author of the five languages of appreciation in the workplace. And the situation all made sense to me. All of a sudden, sweatshirt gate, the light bulb went off. Dr. White taught me what makes one person feel appreciated does not necessarily make another person feel appreciated. And I thought, really? Not everyone receives appreciation in the same way? And Dr. White taught me that we all have our own preferred language of appreciation. And if someone's speaking an appreciation language to me, that is not the language that I speak, I don't recognize it as appreciation. And some of you might be uh, familiar with the uh, Five Languages of Love book. And uh, if you are or not, the concept is the same. If someone is speaking an appreciation language to me, that is not what I understand. It's like if you were speaking Chinese to me and I don't speak Chinese. If you spoke a completely different language, I don't understand it. It means nothing. And so I don't feel appreciated if you talk to me in the wrong appreciation language, even though you've tried to show me I'm valued. So we're going to take a deep dive into these five languages of appreciation so you can make sure that you are speaking a language that people can not only hear and accept, right, but that actually works to make them feel valued. And the first one is words of affirmation. That's actually my language. And so when you speak the language of words of affirmation, you're using words to communicate your thanks and gratitude. And it is the most common of the five languages of appreciation. And I want to just say that again, because it's super important. Words of affirmation is the language of appreciation for the majority of people. So how can you express words of affirmation? Well, the obvious is to verbally share praise for something that that a person has done. Uh, I saw how you helped that person pick up the items that she dropped when she walked in the front door. Um, You helped her right away and you could have just kept on walking by, but you didn't. That's specific. That is not, hey, good job today, buddy. Two thumbs up, right? People don't want to hear a generic thank you. They want to hear specific, individualized words that tell them why they're valued and what makes them special. You can praise people one-on-one, You can praise them during a meeting with them uh, or with a group. Uh, You can praise informally when you see people as you're walking around. Uh, You can call someone on the phone to do it as well if it's not someone that you see too often. You can also recognize someone in front of a very big group, like an annual meeting, a town hall, and so forth. But please, please, please exercise care when you do this because some of your team members would think, Madison Square Garden isn't big enough uh, of an arena for me to be recognized. Uh, That would be me, by the way. Um, But others would be mortified by that. There are lots of people who don't want to receive recognition in front of a large group. Uh, In fact, Dr. White has found that 40 to 50 percent of people, what you consider might be a great honor to be in front of a room, 40 to 50 percent of people see it as torture. So half of your people consider it torture to go up and get an award and hear things about them at a a meeting, a large meeting. So it's another reason to really know your people um, or simply ask them if it would be okay before you do it. You can also appreciate someone with a good old fashioned uh, handwritten note. They go a long way. You can send an email or even a text. But while email and text is nice, Honestly, handwritten notes, people save them for years. And every time they see it, you get this little residual effect because they feel valued again, right? So they see it again and again, and it makes them feel valued. You want to take it up a notch? Mail it home. Mail it home so they can show it off to their family and hang it on their refrigerator. You want to take it up another notch? 
maybe write a note to their family, their kids, their spouse, their partner, and tell them why you are thankful for all the awesome things that their mom, their dad, their husband, their girlfriend, whoever, the things that they're doing. If you can't get away from writing a form letter, maybe you have thousands of letters that you need to send, at least make it personal by writing a little note on it. So you could have perhaps the CEO, owner of a large organization, write the letter, but you can have perhaps uh, direct supervisors write a little handwritten note in the corner, or you can hand them out personally and give verbal praise as you do. So I shared earlier this concept of what you focus on grows, that what you put a spotlight on will continue to grow and grow. And years ago when I was uh, in leadership, I had a uh, nursing assistant that said to me, Denise, all you ever do is see the bad. (gasps) It was like a knife to my heart. I thought, me? I'm so positive. But she said to me, you know, you walk around, you point out everything we do wrong. You don't point out the things we do right. So we can do a hundred things right and one thing wrong and you'll find that one wrong thing. And, you know, I stewed for a little bit about that. And then I thought about it and thought, you know what? She's right. She's absolutely right. I walk around and see what's not done correctly and correct it. I didn't yell and scream at people, but it's still, I was not noticing all the things that were going right. So what you can do is to make sure as you're walking around that you're seeing the positive, pointing it out and affirming it. One of the other things that you can do with words of affirmation is affirm personality. And so John Maxwell uh, has a concept uh, in his book, The 21 Indispensable uh, Qualities of a Leader. And that is that you put on everyone's head that you meet a confidence level of 10. Like imagine that they literally have a post-it stuck right on their forehead. And then here's the important part. You treat them that way. You treat them as if they are the best that they can possibly be, that they're a VIP. You make them feel that they are the most important person in the world to you. Why? Because when you do that, when you expect the best of them, you're going to get the best in return. Because whether you realize it or not, and I was doing it by focusing on the negative when I was walking around, whether you realize it or not, you're sending off cues to people that say to somebody, you're doing this, great job, I know you can do it, I believe in you, or you're sending a message to them that says, yeah, I'm not so sure about you. But when we send that message out that we expect the best of you, people reach higher and higher and higher to live up to your expectations. They wind up overperforming for you because they believe they can, because you're treating them that way. You help them to see what's possible when they didn't even see it themselves. You can tell them this too. You can let them know what you see. And this is not a one-time performance evaluation, but all the time. By the way, you can even practice this at home. And I love stuff that you can practice at home and at work or wherever, Starbucks or Target. Um, because you're you're just ingraining it even more uh, uh, to use. It becomes a habit. So if it's your family, perhaps, or friends, um, be curious. Focus on their interests. Put a confidence level of 10 on everybody's head, no matter who they are and who you're interacting with. Um, This is really the opportunity to just focus on abilities that you see in people and uh, call those out as much as possible. What I want to make sure that you do uh, don't do is fall into the trap, though, of just sort of giving that generic praise. Uh, remember, I talked about that in the don'ts. Words of affirmation, please make sure that you don't fall into that trap of just sh- sharing generically how somebody's doing, but that you're being very, very specific about that uh, for them. Let's talk about the next language of appreciation, which is quality time. And that's the next most common language. And quality time simply means that you're making time for someone. And as a result, they feel valued. Here's the thing about quality time. It has to be personal. So it's, hey, how's your dog doing after that operation last week? And yes, I did say dog because I'm from New York. So how's your dog doing after that operation last week? Or, hey, how did your son's first birthday party go? All good examples. It can also be work-related. Hey, what are you most proud of this week? What did you do that you're proud of? 
or here's why I'm proud of you. And now you might be thinking, I don't have time to spend with everybody. I don't spend time with all these people. But typically, people don't want an hour from you. They want a few minutes of your time being present with them, genuinely listening to them, genuinely interested in what they're sharing. If you can't do it in person, once again, maybe it's a phone call. The next language of love we're going to talk about is all about this sense of how peeps how people feel. Sorry, not the next language of love, the uh, quality time uh, language of love that we're talking about, the second language of love we're talking about, quality time. It's really about um, how we make people feel. And we've talked about that a lot, but it's something to consider in this language because being around a person isn't just, that's just not enough. Um, because I'm sitting next to you at a conference table or because I'm uh, attending a meeting with you all day. That's not that doesn't count as quality time. You have to interact with people and make them feel valued and that they matter during those interactions. This makes them feel appreciated. So in the scenario of an all day meeting, for example, it's going to be the connection with the person during coffee break or uh, over lunch when you ask questions and you listen to them about how they're doing and, and listen to their responses. That counts as quality time. Keep in mind that quality time as a language of appreciation doesn't always mean quality time with you either. Maybe the person wants quality time with their coworkers or people in other departments. That might, that might be most enjoyable and meaningful to that particular person. So what does quality time actually look like in practice? It looks like us focusing on the person directly in front of us. Not on the phone, not on our laptop, not on our computer. I used to have this uh, horrible, terrible habit of giving my team members sort of half my attention when they popped into my office. Uh, people would come to my office to talk to me and I try to answer my email at the same time. How rude, right? How rude was that? And I realized finally, thankfully, that I was sending this message to people that you're not very valued. You're not very important. And I had to quiet this terrible multitasking monster that lived in my head and still lives there, by the way. I don't know if you know him as well, but lives in my head and uh, hopefully not yours. Um, but if someone came by, once I recognized how rude I was being, when someone came by, what I would do is if it was a quick and I, I could stop, make them feel valued, listen to them. If I was super busy, because there's time sometimes where things you know, you can't stop. I would tell them, like, I have to get this report out tomorrow for a board meeting. Um, I want to hear what you have to tell me. Can you come back at two so I can fully listen to you and concentrate on you and not be distracted? And most people are going to understand that, right? They're going to get that. Here's the thing. Quality time means that you're present. So if you've ever been talking to someone and they're on their phone texting or sending an email, it makes you feel like you don't matter, doesn't it? And so we're looking for the exact opposite of that feeling. So examples of quality time. Um, have a daily meeting with team members in a small group, even if it's just 10 minutes. Imagine if they stopped interrupting you because they knew they were going to get to talk to you 10 minutes every day. You'd save that time invested over lots, right? You'd save many times that 10 minutes. Or set up a time to talk with people one-on-one -on -one to check in how they're doing. Uh, where they're stuck, even what they want to work on to grow themselves. You can encourage people to work on projects together instead of going it alone, uh, someone to bounce ideas off of. You can even suggest to people someone in another department to work with or on another shift or even another site to really stretch themselves. And they're going to feel valued for that feeling of being with others. So I share with you my language of appreciation is words of affirmation. And uh, that's the way that I share usually my appreciation with others um, because language of affirmation works for me. I always thought, well, it, that's kind of the default I go to. And I remember this one particular day when my son, who I have twin boys, um, and my son, who was 16 at the time, was working, uh, we lived by the beach, was working at the beach. And uh, I said to him, you know, Ryan, I am so proud of you. You get up early, you go to work at the beach, your friends are all still sleeping and you ride your bike to work and you have to clean the trash up off the beach. And that's hard work. Thank you for being such a hard worker. 
And I was, I was really proud of that speech that I gave Ryan. I felt like it hit everything. You know, I hit specifics. Um, I hit, you know, about his personality and the, the work ethic that he had. Um, I, you know, how he got to work was very specific. What he did at work was very specific. And I really thought it was perfection. Except it wasn't perfection for Ryan. Ryan is an acts of service person. And so his response to my entire soliloquy of how wonderful he is, was, you're weird. Stop talking. So, and I'm sure he probably rolled his eyes too, big 16. After I discovered this concept of the five languages, I realized Ryan was acts of service, right? As I got more into these languages, I realized Ryan was acts of services. And he would ask me things like, can you go get me a bagel after school? And that involved me leaving my office, driving to the bagel store, dropping it off at the house and going back to my office. And luckily all these things are in the same town, but it was still 20 minutes, 30 minutes, no matter how I cut it. And once I realized Ryan was acts of service, I really tried not to say no to that request because I realized it was how he was made to feel valued. It was how he was made to feel loved uh, and appreciated. So acts of service people are show me people. Don't talk about how much you appreciate me. Don't keep, I, I don't need to spend time with you. Do something for me instead. This could be answering the phone for the receptionist so she can go to a birthday party in the break room. Or maybe it's doing some paperwork for someone who's struggling. The key is to take an action during the course of your day that is meaningful to the person that you're trying to appreciate. Now I'm gonna warn you, to make sure that you don't fall into some traps that exist for this language as well, which is do not be a martyr about it. It's not gonna help anyone if you're like, oh, we're all so busy. Uh, I have to take these 10 minutes for you, right? Don't complain how busy you are with your own work. Um, don't tell them, even if it's true, while you're doing it. Don't give advice about how the job should get done or when performing it that you're going to say, you know, how you should do it is really this way, right? This is not the time for that. Um, if you start, help start by asking someone their permission if you can uh, help them because you don't want it to look like micromanagement. So ask somebody how you can help them. If the immediate answer is nothing, you can't do anything for me or no, I don't need any help. Say to them, you know what? If I cleared my calendar for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, what could I help you with? What would it be that you would most need help with? and see what they say to you and follow up on that rather than them just kind of trying to think of something off the top of their head, which their first answer is probably going to be no. So let's talk a little bit of, about this uh, next uh, language, which is the language of gifts. And um, I find this one to be the most misunderstood language of them all. And so leaders often assume that giving a gift, I know I did this, like a gift card or food is going to make people feel really valued. And, and quite frankly, it's pretty easy. Um, once again, you don't have to be awkward and share words of appreciation. You don't have to spend time with people. You don't have to do something for someone for an act of service, right? We can spend a little bit of money and there's their thank you. How easy is that? But the big problem with this is that gifts is the language of appreciation for only 6% of people only 6% of people. So in fact, almost three quarters of people say that uh, gifts are their least appreciated language of appreciation. Think about that. Gifts are the least appreciated language of appreciation. That means if you are counting on a gift to make your team feel valued or a person feel valued, 94% of them, they're going to spend that gift card. They're going to eat that pizza. They're going to cash that check. But in their mind, the gift does not register as appreciation, unless they're one of that 6% that fall into that being their top language. By the way, if tangible gifts does happen to be the language appreciation for a team member, so if, if it does happen to be for a team member, um, what we know is the most appreciated gift that people have is food items. 
But even when we do food, we have to think about making it individualized, right? We would not want to be serving the pizza you see in front of you there, the pepperoni sausage pizza to uh, someone who's vegan, doesn't eat meat, right? It doesn't eat cheese. Um, we have to think about that being individualized. But again, think you're going to totally miss the mark with the majority of people if you are giving gifts. Um, you can do some fun things to to make sure that you capture the uh, few people that do have gifts as their top language. Um, some people have like a little traveling like stuffed dog that becomes the top dog award or a chalkboard that says chalk one up for this person, right? There's tons of ideas on Pinterest and if you Google it and uh, that you can think, especially around school, schools tend to have a lot of great ideas about these things. Um, but just think about the fact that it's not going to reach the majority of your team members. By the way, if you're not creative and some of that stresses you to think about looking uh, for creative ideas to thank people. Guaranteed somebody would love to do this on your team or in your organization. So tap into somebody else. They'd be, love to be part of it. And it's a form of appreciation asking them to help you with that. I want to share with you just another tip too, that the element of surprise is one of the best ways to provide um, rewards that are meaningful and memorable. And so if you can add an element of surprise, so surprise everybody with their favorite drink from Starbucks or um, surprise somebody at uh, you know, the end of the day, say, go ahead and leave a half an hour early um, and give them a gift card to go get some coffee on the way home or whatever, uh, that element of surprise people will remember. They'll remember it way more than if it's just something that is a scheduled gift or award. So think about finding somebody on your team that uh, you can practice this with, somebody who deserves to be rewarded and surprise them. So the last language of love, I told you there was five of them. The last language of love that we're going to talk about is the language of physical touch. And so physical touch is the uh, last language, and it is the most confusing one in the workplace. And in fact, it's actually been taken out of the quiz that you can take to determine your language of appreciation. So what's physical touch? It's appropriate means of sharing that you value someone. A high five, a pat on the back, a handshake. You can't really shake your own hand, can you? A handshake. Um, but when it was tested in the workplace, touch was actually the language of appreciation that was the least common. And so because it also is wrought with ways that things can go wrong, um, it was eliminated uh, from the uh, workplace appreciation, the five languages of appreciation in the workplace, they've eliminated that from the quiz. But do know that for some people, uh, touch shows them that you care. So we've covered each language and maybe now you're curious to see how many people fall into each category, how many people fall into each category. So here's how they stack up. Words of affirmation I shared with you um, earlier that 45% of people fall into that. Acts of service and quality time both have about 20 to 25% of people that fall into that category. Gifts is 6%. And touch, I'm not touching that one, pun intended, you're on your own. We're not going to uh, cover touch. And um, once again, it's a very small number. I think it was one or 2% of people. So how can you know the language of each person on your team? Well, there's a test in the five languages book that you can have um, people take. Um, there's a code in it that you can use to take it. A lot of people, uh, it's a great book, by the way, wonderful. You can buy it for, sometimes people do a book club with it. You can buy it for your team, great. But most people can't commit to doing that for their entire team right now. So maybe you're thinking you can ask people, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't know their language of appreciation. So one way is to see what people are asking for or complaining about. So if you have someone that asks for approval all the time, did I do that the right way? How was that? What do you think? They're probably a words of affirmation person. If you hear people say a lot to you, you know, I just love five minutes of your time or I need just 10 minutes of you, right? They might be someone who prefers quality time. Someone complaining like no one ever helps me around here. They're likely an acts of service person. So look for those clues. Be an expert noticer and look for those clues to uh, what someone's specific language is so that you can uh, fulfill that language. So where do you begin with this? Oh, all right, we covered so much in this session. Where do you begin? Well, today you can do two things to begin. One of those things 
is to focus on the field. We talked a lot about the field today. So I want you really to focus on the feel. Know your people. We, we've covered a bunch of ways that you can do that. And the second thing, I promised you earlier that I would give you an answer to your prayers, a leadership playbook, I would tell you, for times of crisis or just tough times in general. And that is fearless in the face of crisis. And fearless in the face of crisis is our on-demand online course that really is the answer to your prayers. If you're tired, if you're burnt out, if you are ready to throw in the towel, this is for you. And that was Lisa who took this course as well. Uh, she took fearless in the face of crisis. And here's what she had to say about it. She told us that, you know what, my staff needed to be connected to their work. And, and she talked about how can you make your staff connect to this important work that they're doing and they know that work is so much harder right now, harder than it's ever been, right? And she said, that's what I was looking for in the course. How can I help people find the purpose in their work? How could I be a better leader for them? And that she got the answers to this course, uh, to the answers to those questions in this course. So fearless in the face of crisis is literally a step-by-step -step approach to leading during times of crisis. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. I have zero time zero time to take a course right now. But think about how much time you would save, how much of your sanity you would save if you knew why your people were coming to you for everything. If you knew what, if they knew what they could do about it without coming to you. And you're going to figure out why some people aren't showing up when you need them most and what you can do about it. So do not worry, we are not going to teach you a bunch of best practices that take months to implement because you know what, you don't have time for that. And sometimes they don't stick anyway. All right, I know that nonsense doesn't work for you because it didn't work for me. What I'm talking about is tools, actions, and small but mighty tweaks to get you to move through your week in a way that's going to transform the way that you work as a leader and that your team works as well. Fearless in the Face of Crisis is, is the ultimate playbook for leaders. It's self-directed, it's online, it's five modules, but in small, easy to digest videos, some of them are seven minutes long that are filled with simple actions that you can do immediately. I think the longest one is about 20 minutes. So if you're tired of listening to people who kind of just talk very philosophical and and it's not very interesting, I have got your back because this course has been designed by me and Arlene Smith. And it's got, we've got 40 years of experience in being in leadership positions. We know what you deal with. We know what works for you. We've worked in healthcare. So this material is tried and tested with over 500 people now that have gone through this course. And they've had incredible and instantaneous results. We've got client success stories to prove it. And even better, by taking Fearless in the Face of Crisis, you get seven CEUs. It's been approved for NAB as well as SHRM credit. So now is not the time to falter and doubt after everything that's gone on in our world. We're finally seeing the light in the end of the tunnel. Now is the time to spring into action, knowing that you have what it takes to not just survive, but really, truly to thrive through any challenge that comes your way now or in the future. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to you being part of the Fearless in the Face of Crisis family. We have an awesome Facebook group as well um, when you register for the course. And we do monthly, I do monthly lives in there where I take questions and I answer your questions, anonymous questions, or you can post them in the Facebook group if you want to, don't, don't care about being anonymous. Uh, and I answer them and coach live. So you get answers directly from me about your greatest leadership challenges. So in addition to the online course, you also get to continue to grow and develop as a leader. Thank you for what you're doing uh, to support those in the healthcare field. Thank you for showing up every day. Thank you for the work that you are doing. I appreciate it. And I appreciate it, you uh, for doing what you do each and every day.